so I am Alex Polvey, a co-founder and CEO of CoreOS, and I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, this is our first event here in New York, um, so thank you so much for taking the time to come out today. Um, to kick things off, I kind of wanted to set the theme of today. There's a, a set of emerging technology around containers and distributed systems that appears to be the, the next generation way of running infrastructure. Um, and we wanted to have a discussion today focused primarily on the, on the business um, value side of this. A lot of the discussion to date in the industry, it's been very exciting. Uh, it's also been very focused on the technologies itself. Um, but today we wanted to bring together a group of folks um, to talk about you know, how and why are companies prioritizing this work. I think this last night I was at dinner with our friends uh, from CA and uh, he mentioned how they're doing all this retooling and replatforming around this, uh, but they had to come meet with their, you know, their CTO uh, to, to explain like why are we making these investments, why are we spending time on that. And that's exactly the, the discussion we wanted to have today. So you're going to be hearing from some of the uh, early adopters of this technology uh, at, at companies, uh, large and small. You're also going to you know, hear more focus on the, on the, the, the business value side of this. Um, and so I'd like to, to thank a number of our speakers we have here today, um, companies of all sizes. Uh, I'd also like to thank the folks from the um, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, Cloud Native is the this industry term um, that's uh, really representing what's happening right now. So it's this combination of containers, dynamically scheduled infrastructure. Um, throughout this talk, I, you'll, I'll call it Google's infrastructure for everyone else. Um, but when we refer to Cloud Native or Giphy, um, that's, that's what uh, I, I'm referring to. And these, these guys are kicking off their first uh, meeting tomorrow. So we have representatives from all, um, you know, all walks of industry kind of in this space. Um, so why did we start working on on all this technology in the first place. Uh, we got going about a little over two and a half years ago. Uh, this, I, whenever I tell this story, I like to go Google the recent news here and see, um, see what's come up. This one's particularly disturbing. This is from yesterday. Um, security on the internet has really gotten out of hand. Um, there's, uh, this is no longer a, a unexpected thing. Um, as our lives get more and more connected, uh, we continue to get exploited. Um, and when we started CoreOS, we wanted to take a, a look at what could we do to fundamentally improve the security of the internet. It's a, something that we think us as a team has unique capabilities of solving, um, but also would solve a big problem that's happening today. Uh, to exaggerate this point, we, we have a product um, called Quay, which is a, a container registry offering, and we recently released a feature called security scanning. What we're doing is taking your application container, your bundle of your, your application, and doing automatic vulnerability analysis on it. When we did this across the millions of containers we have on Quay, we found that 80% of them still had Heartbleed in it. Um, so, a couple thoughts on this. First, that's crazy <laughs> that, that that's the case. Um, and second, we've gotten to the point with, with vulnerabilities um, that we give them brands and, and logos and names. Um, it's, it's, it's really gotten out of hand. And so um, we, we took a step back and, and wanted to rethink, how can we solve this problem you know, at, at its lowest level? How can we dramatically improve the security of the internet? Um, so our belief is that the key to security at the end of the day is all around updates. Um, you need to update your, your SSL libraries, you need to update your applications. There will always be another vulnerability, another hack, but at the end of the day, if, if you can update it, if you can painlessly get to that latest version that's secure, we think that this is sort of the root cause of, of vulnerabilities at the end of the day and the root solution as well. Now we've seen um, a lot of success on the consumer side of improving this. I used to work at Mozilla, and one of the, the biggest step functions we ever saw in terms of improving security in the web browser was when we turned on automatic updates, started treating it more like a software as a service, as an application you know, that continuously you're running the latest version. And today, when you log into your browser, you don't really ever think about running the latest version. It's just always there and up to date. Our phones have automatic update mechanisms um, that, that run continuously. They've probably gotten so annoying to you that you've turned on automatic updates, so it just happens because you don't want to approve it every single day because they're shipped so constantly at this point. Um, and even our, our desktop OSs, Windows and, and um, Mac, have, have done um, capabilities like this. But over on the server side, 
uh, the way we treat our infrastructure is get it running and don't touch it. It's literally the opposite. Uh, we are so afraid that our infrastructure is um, so fragile that if we make any little change to any little piece, everything's gonna go up in a big flaming uh, mess. And so this is, is clearly the issue. Um, if updates are, uh, are our solution to security, the reason we're not getting them is because we built these, these architectures that are so fragile um, that we're not able to service them easily. So we have, the, we have our problem, we have um, our, our view on what the fix is, but now how do we actually approach it? And that's where uh, this comes in. I get tired of saying Google's infrastructure for everyone else, so I've just called it Giphy. <laughs> it's the style of infrastructure that uh, is, is related to containers, dynamically scheduled on standard hardware. Standard in 2015 can mean in a cloud environment or on a, on a bare metal server in your data center. And it's, it's this methodology that has a lot of, of um, benefits that we believe can be exploited to take advantage um, of you know, fixing these problems that we want. So there's a number of benefits of this. There's one, more security. The, the hyperscale companies um, are seen as the ones that are, are the most um, secure out there. The folks like um, Google and Facebook and so on. Um, these companies are also known for their efficiency levels. In their data center, they're able to get the, the highest levels of utilization uh, that the industry has seen. Uh, and we also recognize these folks for being able to deliver and ship products as quickly as, as anyone in the industry. And I believe that it's because of their server infrastructure, their architecture that they have, that's distinctly different than how most traditional enterprises um, run their environments that, that unlocks this. But we're also living at a time where this running web services and running digital is, is important to everybody. Every business has exploding demands um, in terms of uh, providing web services, providing uh, these new types of, of digital products. Um, and so we are now at a point where not only do we need to learn with them, but we also need to compete with the, with the hyperscale companies as well. Google's getting into cars, Facebook's getting into payments, um, and they have an advantage on infrastructure um, that, that is unmatched in enterprise. Um, so we believe that, that this style of infrastructure unlocks our capabilities around security that we care so much about, but also will provide tremendous benefits to, to companies um, as we move forward. So to start tackling this problem, uh, one of the quickest ways to start changing the way the world runs their infrastructure is with open source software. So we put together a number of projects and contributed heavily to the, the projects that, that existed that were related to this, highlight a few of them. Um, CoreOS Linux is our lightweight Linux OS that automatically updates itself. Um, we have etcd, which is the uh, distributed data store that's an underpinning of building any distributed system. Uh, when we built etcd, we had a theory that companies wanted more distributed systems, but the hard parts were just too hard, and that's what was limiting it. Um, and so we put out etcd to solve those problems, and we've seen that blown up. Um, Kubernetes. Um, is a cluster management system put together uh, initially by the team at Google that, that inspired a lot of this thinking. Um, Google's infrastructure system is, is called Borg, and when the container movement started about two and a half years ago, the Google team that developed that stepped up to build an open source version to help take the best lessons learned um, from running this infrastructure for a decade and uh, making it available to, to all companies. And then Docker. Docker, of course, has done a, a great job of, of starting this movement and really getting the, the, uh, the awareness of the power of, of containers and this style of infrastructure out there. So one thing I'd just like to call out is that this, none of this existed three years ago. Uh, this, is, this is all um, brand new technology. Uh, before we've before, you know, just a few years ago, uh, it was nearly, it was extremely difficult for companies to build this style of infrastructure. It was only up to the biggest companies that, that could afford to hire dedicated engineering teams to do it. So I'd like to pause for one second and just do a round of applause for all the folks that have put this technology together to get it to market. So while open source is important um, and very critical to ubiquitous adoption, businesses also need solutions um, that are put together. Not all companies want to spend time piecing together the individual um, parts in order to build their own systems. So while we've built all of this in such a way that a company can go build their own version of Tectonic, we, we offer a, a product um, that we just GA'd um, three, three or four weeks ago now 
um, called Tectonic Enterprise, which is, it is that Google-like infrastructure in a box. It is the, the prepackaged solution for companies that want to, to adopt this style of infrastructure, but don't necessarily want to spend the time integrating all the different pieces. Additionally, the way I like to think about it is when we go back to our phone analogy a little bit, um, if your phone was to boot up and the first thing that you had to do was write an application to get it running, it would be pretty difficult to get value out of that. You need some pre-installed things, you need some initial tools set up um, to help you get going, and those are the sorts of things that we're providing in our, in our distribution of all this. So Tectonic is a, a, a business-ready platform that contains everything you need from CoreOS up to the Kubernetes layer, as well as some additional applications on top to get you going quickly on the platform. So we have it. We have, we have all the open source pieces. We have um, products um, around uh, products to help make this ready for businesses. We have all the pieces that we need, right? Well, we think that, um, we think that there's more. And today, um, we're excited to announce uh, so our latest innovation in this space. And we think that it's, a, it's an important and very critical one, both in terms of the security functionality that it unlocks, but also in providing a complete story um, that will really help companies get the, the benefits of this style of infrastructure. So we're calling it distributed trust and computing. Um, this is a style of infrastructure um, that is really only possible when you run your infrastructure in this Google-like or cloud-native cloud -native way. Um, and as you might be able to expect, it's a combination of distributed systems and, and trusted computing, pretty clever product marketing there. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about it and how it works. So who here is familiar with trusted computing? You heard about this at all? So all of you um, have a trusted computing de device in your, in your pocket uh, right now. I'm assuming you all have a smartphone, but um, our, our Android and, and iPhones are, are actually trusted computing devices. Um, and what, what that means is the hardware itself is um, programmed to only allow certain software to run cryptographically. Uh, so that means when you turn on your phone, um, it goes and verifies kind of every piece of software that's in, in the stack. This is important for a number of reasons, um, but one of, the, one of the principal benefits of this is it's why we, we don't have you know, viruses and malware on our phones. Um, it's just kind of not a problem. Now, these are the types of things that, when they're not a problem, you don't notice them as much. But if you think about it, you know, phones, we don't see those popping up in the news very often. And, and we believe that one of the core pieces of technology required to do this is this capability of trusted computing. So, um, wanted to geek out for one second. I know I said I wanted to keep it high level, but I can't help myself. I'm a pretty technical guy, so I wanted to explain how, how all this works. So down in the hardware uh, is where it all begins, and we carry it all the way up to the cluster level. So in, in the firmware, um, there's a few pieces of, of technology that's actually rooted in the machines themselves. We take, a, uh, we take a cryptographic key, which is in the firmware, and combine that with a piece of hardware called the TPM, or the Trusted Platform Module, uh, and that's where the process begins, when you turn on the server, okay? From there, um, the, the firmware itself verifies both the bootloader and then the OS and starts bringing it up through this, this it's called a static root of trust. You're saying from the very root, you're, you're booting this machine up. From there, the OS comes up in a completely immutable state. If anything changes in that OS, if one block on the file system, it is rendered into a state that is no longer um, seen as verified because it is, it's different. It's not what we expected. Um, from there, we carry this up into our container runtime. Um, the container runtime performs validation on on uh, the containers itself, as well as logs into the, uh, the TPM, the containers that it has ran. Um, and then from there, on the cluster management level, now that the server has booted, we can remotely verify um, that the server has come up in a state that's trusted before allowing it to join the cluster. Because once it is part of the cluster, it's able to get your compute, it's able to get your, your secrets, it's able to get everything. So it's important that you trust that machine before it actually joins, um, joins the, the cluster itself. On top of all of that, through this whole process, we have a tamper-proof audit log that's powered, that's the part that the TPM does for us. Um, that means you know, when you get compromised, uh, you're able to, uh, when you get compromised, one of the things the attackers do is they'll go clean up themselves, um, edit all your log entries, and, and so on. But by integrating with the hardware, uh, we're able to make it such that you get these, these audit logs which are tamper-proof um, in the event that you're hacked. Uh, so, 
So again, cool technology, but let's talk about like, what does it actually do for you? So um, our first use case of this was with our partners over at Cloudflare. Uh, Cloudflare is a, a large content delivery network. They have data centers all over the world. Um, and Cloudflare, uh, they also have a lot of secrets. They have um, a big chunk of the web's uh, private SSL keys for serving, serving SSL traffic um, through their content delivery network. They also run their data centers you know, in, in third party or potentially untrusted data centers, uh, maybe even potentially hostile. And what this technology allows you to do is guarantee cryptographically that your servers are in a state uh, that you trust um, before giving them, giving them data. So in Cloudflare, Claire, excuse me, in Cloudflare's use case, they take, um, they, they boot the server, they then check that it is in this, this trusted state, and then they, they distribute it. And they do this in data centers all over the world. The next kind of major innovation in all of this is attacks that were previously invisible um, are now, now brought to light. These are things that, that you just cannot um, really see or know. That's the point of these, these attacks. This involves attacks to the firmware itself. Uh, this, this involves attacks to the, the OS uh, and lower level pieces as well as root kits um, and attacks to the, the bootloader and so on. So these are the low level pieces um, that right now, I mean, there's, there's very, very difficult ways to understand if, if you've been compromised there. There's really not a lot of options. You're just hoping um, at, at this point. Um, and lastly, um, the, the verifiable audit log. So the way that this gets used is no, no system is perfectly secure. Applications will get compromised. But when your application gets compromised, you need to understand kind of where and, and how is the damage you know, affected your infrastructure. And so with these audit logs, you can take the log from the machines of every single container that's ran on this host and apply that to the rest of the cluster to understand which subset of hosts were affected on, and ran the applications that were ended up being compromised. And the tamper-proofness of this is the important part. You need to have a, a chunk of data that you can, you can ensure is correct. And again, all of this is done using uh, heavy cryptography. One last piece to all of this I'd like to mention um, is around some, a story about Windows 8. So when Windows 8 was released a few years ago, um, it made quite a bit of news in the free software world um, due to Windows turning on and requiring a technology called Secure Boot, which is what we use uh, in order to start that root of trust. Um, so Secure Boot with Windows meant that these laptops were issued um, from the hardware manufacturers with Microsoft's keys in the firmware, effectively saying that this server can only run the software that Microsoft um, pre prescribes to you. Okay, this is, this is how you get the security benefit. This is how, you, uh, how Microsoft can protect you against these same issues that, that um, you know, I previously mentioned. Uh, but it also means that your laptop is cryptographically locked into running only Microsoft authorized software. Now, as you might imagine, this upset a few folks in the free software world. <laughs> um, this is effectively, I mean, it is DRM. Okay, and while you can question Microsoft's motives, um, it, it is generally agreed that somebody with their hardware should be able to run um, whatever software they want. Um, so when CoreOS engineer Matthew Garrett heard about this, um, he decided to do something about it and made the, the changes to the low-level software um, that enforces this to allow users to, to put their own control um, into the system. So this means that, that you can um, you can use these technologies, but you can be in control of the software that, that it actually runs. Um, this ended up winning him an award for the Free Software Foundation as well as a board seat um, on the Free Software Foundation for this work um, and its overall benefit to, to the world in terms of free software. And so we've taken this technology um, and applied it to our system with distri distributed trusted computing. Um, we've inverted the DRM um, and turned it on its head. And what this means is we take our customer's keys, we take your, your enforcement and embed that down into the firmware. This means that the hardware is cryptographically under your control, that, only, that, that machine will only run the software that you explicitly authorized to run, including our, our software, CoreOS Linux and, and everything above the stack. You have, to, you have to actually go and sign and validate it. Um, we think that this is a, a big innovation um, in the sense that you are now fully in control. And when I mean in control, I mean, again, 
with cryptography, not just I can push the power button or change it. Um, so we're pretty proud of, of this innovation as well, and we think that this represents a, a very major change um, in, in the level of integrity and control that companies are going to get inside of their environments. So quick little recap. These are just the beginning of the capabilities that this unlocks um, around trusted computing. You can run your, your infrastructure in third party and potentially untrusted data centers. You can prevent these attacks that previously were just invisible to you. Um, you can verify uh, what happened and where it happened in a way that's, that's tamper proof um, when things do go wrong. And lastly, we're giving you this security benefit while also giving you a degree of control that has just never been done before uh, in server infrastructure. So you can get started on this today. Um, we are opening up this product today um, for initial set of users to start getting going. We've also released a white paper really under, um, explaining all of the, the different technology in play here. Um, so I recommend that, that you go check this out. To tie things up here with Tecton Tectonic Enterprise, we're giving you that end-to-end -end platform of everything you need to get going on this new style of infrastructure. We've uh, given you an operational model um, that has been proven at hyperscale. Uh, we are also unlocking a whole new class of infrastructure in order to uh, further our mission around security and, and give companies new capabilities. I look at this and it's for a server, server guys uh, world, we, we have the equivalent of we just booted the iPhone. Okay, it's a, it's a, whole, new, uh, a whole new class and way of running infrastructure that unlocks uh, new capabilities that, that haven't been done before. Um, and while we couldn't have imagined things like Uber when the iPhone was first re released, we believe that this is going to create a whole new class of, of applications and possibilities in, inside companies' environments. So I ask you to join us. Join us today to hear our stories from these companies that have so graciously donated their time um, and, and energy to, to come here today. I ask you to join us to learn from the hyperscale guys. We have you know, friends at Google coming and talking about how they do it, and why they do it. Um, I ask you to prioritize this work. It needs attention and budget, lots of budget, um, in order to um, make this happen and to really move, move the web forward. And finally, I'd like you to join us in our mission to fundamentally improve the security of the internet. Thank you.